So Freddy died and Freddy's dead, but of course the studios couldn't stay away, and Wes Craven approached them with this new idea to come back to the series and do his vision of, a very meta vision of a movie where the actors would actually be playing themselves and their impact, the impact of the Nightmare series, what it's had on them. At this point in his career, Wes was kind of going through a slump. Mm. He had this and then Vampire in Brooklyn. Which I love Vampire in Brooklyn. Well, I mean, I love, but I like it a lot. This movie bombed at the box office, didn't make money. Vampire in Brooklyn came out, didn't make money. But two years after this, he has Scream on the horizon, which will take him back to New Heights, especially with the Scream Before series. he completely jumps off the face of the earth again, then comes back for with my soul to take. Hey, man, Hollywood's a tough place, man. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down, sometimes you're... Just gone. Just gone. Yeah. Sometimes your performance is so bad, you just disappear off the face of the earth. New Nightmare came out in 1994. Again, it was Wes's vision. All the actors liked the idea of playing themselves. Of course, the biggest thing is we have the return of Heather Langenkamp, who was in part one and part three. Let's talk about the cast for a second because one thing stood out to me right away about this movie. There's a damn kid actor in it. Oh, yeah, Dylan! Let's get... Fuck. You know, I said in the part five podcast, but kid actors in horror movies are just so likely to bring them down and ruin them for me. Because you know what? I know that they're actually not really in danger. And I know that somehow they're going to be the one that thwarts the villain. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, but spoiler, New Nightmare is going to check off all those boxes on my list. And, and, and this calls into question, why do writers do this? Why do they put kids in horror movies? It can work. The movie, it, it can work. If it's a group of young actors who um, the whole story is centered around them and it's fun, that's cool. But when there's one kid actor in the horror movie playing a prominent role outside of maybe six cents where the little kid was an amazing actor. This kid, I swear, at least in this movie, I don't think I've really seen him in anything else. I probably haven't, just don't realize. Well, he was actually in a Bruce Willis movie called Mercury Rising. Bruce Willis saw this movie and said, that's my boy, and cast him in his next movie, Mercury Rising, which was a mild, solid hit. So no matter what we say about him, and also he was on the show Full House. So I'm going to say this. uh, I did not like this kid's acting in this movie. (laughs) One bit. This kid's got chops. They're just not here in this movie. This, this, I couldn't stand this kid. This kid, in my opinion, is worse than Jacob in the fifth That's movie. That's blasphemy, right? That is not blasphemy. Worse than Jacob? You want to know why I say that? Because in part five, I don't care what you say, the kid may have had a, air quote, prominent role, but if you take him out of the movie, the movie does not change. Look, in part five, Freddy was using Jacob to... What the hell was Freddy... You're right. I, I can't you even, could take all, Jacob. All the top of my head, I can't figure out what the hell Freddy's plan was in part five because they didn't explain it well. So maybe he wasn't that prominent. Dylan in this and, one is very prominent. Yes. You take him out of this movie and you're going to have to write a completely different script. Okay, but listen, man. Any kid, though, if you give him a script and you're like, all right, this is where you, uh, in a Freddy voice, say, never sleep again. Nobody's going to give a good performance with those lines. Come on. Never sleep again. The one thing I'm wondering is, who even decided to think a kid would be intimidating with fucking butter knives as his claws? I was scared when I saw that scene. (laughs) Also, I'm wondering... I turned on the nightlight, so... I was like, oh my god! No, I'm just playing. They actually used the opening music from the first one here, too. (laughs) Right. It's a good callback, because that is, like, really... As much as I love when they play a pop song at the beginning of these Nightmare movies... That's some airy-ass music. That's scary music they play. Oh, yeah, and they want you to feel that, hey, we are serious about this movie. But so now we see that this Freddy Claw is completely robotic. It has, like, a life of its own, like it's possessed. Gee, I wonder who's possessing it. Well, obviously not Freddy because then you see him chop off his hand and he's about to put put the glove on the hand, and then we find out it's actually a... uh, you know, they literally did the same thing in Nightmare 1, except this time we're seeing a special effects artist doing the scene himself. Plus, New Line Cinema told me that Freddy was dead just two years before this. I'm going to take them at their word and say Freddy's dead. Uh, well, so I don't know what this thing is, but it sure isn't my pal Freddy because he's dead somewhere. Well, and also, hanging out with, He's hanging in the, the other world with Carlos. And also, boy, so. if you haven't noticed, he has a fifth claw this time. Oh, All five fingers has a claw now. Maybe we'll get a creative death scene out of it. Probably yep. not that. So this is also where we meet Chase, Nancy, Wes Craven, and Dylan. Chase is her husband, or I guess we have to call her Heather because, you know, she's playing herself. That's true. So uh, Chase is Heather's husband in real life, as per this movie. 
Um, Dylan is her son in real life, per this movie. I doubt that's their actual names. And not to be super confusing, but in real, real life, the actor who plays Chase is not actually married to Adelaine Camp. So. I figured. Nope. And obviously the kid is also not related to Heather Langenkamp. In fact, the, other, the actor who plays Chase felt awkward about playing this tech role because he felt like they had him looking like a male model. So. <laughs> and I was just like, that is kind of Hollywood. So, Well, not only that, but are you, is that guy really saying that good-looking people can't be smart? Yes. Classist son of a bitch. Well, he said in a way of like, you know, they could have dirtied me up a little bit. Basically just made him look more blue-collar versus... Looking like he just came out the makeup trailer onto the set to be a tech guy, so, and I can agree with that. He lo- he looks like yeah. Well, how about this as for your tech? Obviously, this guy knows nothing about tech because then the Freddy glove goes haywire and kills what what were their names? Terry and victim number one, victim number two. Yeah, fair. Uh, it kills them and then goes for Chase when an earthquake happens. And you know, I'm not mad that the tech doesn't make sense or the tech is bad because. This is Nancy's dream, and what does she know about technology? Exactly. How, so, how would her subconscious be able to know the latest in technology? So, I do want to bring up one thing about this earthquake scene, because I noticed that Heather and Chase run to Dylan's room and huddles over him. If the house falls, I don't think her parents is going to protect them. What you're supposed to do when an earthquake happens, if you cannot get safely out of the house, is you stand in a doorway. For people who live in California, um, why do they not know this? Well, in Heather Langham's acting classes, they never taught her how to react to an earthquake. So they should have had earthquake drills, though. But they live in California, which has prominent earthquakes, mainly the San Andreas Fault, as you jokingly admitted, and when you know with San Andreas. Exactly. They're thinking worst case, shit goes to hell, but then the rock comes and saves them. So. And I think that's a pretty good backup plan. Hey, we didn't protect our child, but here's the rock at the front door and a chopper to save us, all right? That's what they're thinking, buddy. Well, how about this? Uh, as Chase leaves, four slash marks come in at once, which could have been from the earthquake, but... If I'm head of lane camp, I'm, raising, I'm batting an eye at this because, yes, that could be the earthquake, but if I'm the prominent star of the Nightmare on Elm Street series with Freddy Krueger, that... Big ass claw mark, we're looking like either a damn dinosaur from Jurassic Park had came into the house, or looking like a big ass Freddy Krueger claw had taken the wall. I, I at this point, I think she should be a little bit suspect. Little oh bit. yeah, not not over the top, but a little bit. So also, I just noticed something. So now we also kind of get introduced to another element of this movie, which is actually prominent with Heather Langenkamp because she actually had this issue, is a stalker. Yeah. And she ended up getting a phone call, and it literally said in a Freddy voice, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. No, 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 but it's hilarious that it's like one, two, and then she hang up, and then it calls again, and the guy's like, Freddy's coming for you! Because <laughs> he knew she was going to hang up again. <laughs> that dude was dedicated. He's like, I'm going to say as fast as possible to get this shit out. He's like, Freddy's coming for you! Yeah. I, I, I laughed my ass off at that. That was hilarious. And then another earthquake. And then we uh, meet- How many damn earthquakes are there going to be? Well, considering the fact this one was explained off by a big-ass truck. So this one wasn't an earthquake. Have we met Julie the babysitter yet? We're about to, because she walks up to the door, knock, 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 and in walks Julie. She comes in as a babysitter. I'm guessing a highly paid babysitter, because she's babysitting the son of a prominent... Horror icon. <laughs> well, let's, this is interesting to talk about. Let's talk about Heather Langkamp's place in Hollywood this time, 1994. She well, we kind of figure find out what her place in Hollywood is as she's talking to the guy interviewing her about the Nightmare on Elm Street series. So, in the grand scheme of things, a B movie actress, basically. Fair. Okay, so but I'm saying it's a highly paid. Julie should be getting paid, paid. Oh, she most likely is. And cookies. If, if if she doesn't get a big paycheck, she needs to stand in the middle of that house and say, "What are you waiting for? You know, I'm right here." With her hand out. Okay, so the limo. Remember, the limo driver comes up. Yep. And the he, limo comes and she's. She's still getting the calls, but then eventually the limo driver's bugging her. We're going to be late. I think we're going to be late. Well, remember when she got that first call from the limo driver, she's literally thinking as a stalker again. It's like, leave us alone, you son of a bitch. This is the limousine service, ma'am. He's here th- to take you to the interview. He's thinking, I don't get paid enough for this. <laughs> like, she better give me a hell of a tip for yelling at me. <laughs> but finally she gets in the car. So this is where she actually comments on her own career because he's like, in a way, being sort of creepy stalker himself. He's like, hey, you're that girl from that movie. 
Yeah, with the knives. They ne- and then he even says it. They never should have killed off Freddy. Well, that's funny. But she says something about, like, I'm hardly a star. So that's how she sees herself, which I guess makes her more likable. Even though she's writing to an interview in a limo. Right. But, and I'll, wait a minute. This interview is annoying as hell. The talk show host. is only asking about Nightmare on Elm Street and horror movies. He keeps asking questions, and before she can answer, he asks another question. Oh, that's right. You do have a boy. What's his name? It's like, uh, I ain't answering that on live TV. <laughs> and then uh, his name is, now would you let him watch your movies? My, my, and what about Robert England? Would you leave him with, with, with Robert England? Well, I don't know. It depends. I got a big special treat for you, Heather. Here's Robert England. And we get our first actual real Freddy appearance in the movie. Yeah. And then this not even meta as hell. Super and meta. not even 10 seconds later, he is out of his makeup and is Robert England. And he's very smiley. Did you notice how Heather was jealous that he was getting all the autographs in the, the dressing room? Well, that's because Freddy is Freddy. She was like, I got to go, Robert. It's like, yeah, that's because no one's asking you for an autograph. So, I Well, they of, probably would have if Robert England didn't show up. I thought Wes did a cool thing when um, cool shot with Freddy in the audience where he's waving his hands. Oh, yeah. And it slows down, and it's kind of, like, scary a little bit. Well, they Because it looks like music. actually Freddy then. He lo- adds the music. He does. He has just the light beaming on, so all you see is the... Uh, yeah. The outline. You don't even actually see him. You see the outline. You see kind of how, how Heather's taking it in. Mm-hmm. And from her perspective, it looks like Freddy. But it was like a beautiful, smart use of slow motion. Like, good job, Wes. Good job. Well, that's because he that was the only time he ever used slow motion in this movie. The motherfucking Freddy vs. Jason every six minutes to break it out and it's stupid every time. Oh, yeah. So, Rob Shea cameo. Mr. Bob Shea's in every single one of these movies. Yes. But here he actually gets to, like, act a little bit. No, he gets to play himself. Well, who isn't acting when they're playing themselves, though? So. That was really meta and really psychological. So, Do any of us really know our, each other ourselves? So basically, Bob Shea's pitching to Heather, hey, Wes has been working on a new script, and you're the star. And she's immediately hesitant, and she's like, I've got so much stuff going on. And I think to myself, I don't think you're telling the truth, Heather. So you just don't want to be in this horror movie. Because it's another nightmare movie. Yeah, and she's thinking what I'm thinking. Hey, I thought you guys killed off Freddy. Yeah, New Line Cinema, I thought you killed off Freddy, buddy. Well, here's another thing. Uh, Rob line as Bob Shea. One, one thing we also kind of find out, uh, and this happens really to everybody, when Heather starts asking Rob questions, all of a sudden their phone will start ringing, and the, character, and the person will be like, oh. Well, she makes a key point in the scene, though. She's like, since Wes started writing the script... Has anything weird been happening? Like ring, have, ring, ring, have ring. Have been having dreams or ring, ring, weird ring, phone ring. calls? Ring, 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 ring. Why don't you answer your phone, Bob? What would be hilarious is if he picked up the phone and it was the same limo driver and be like, can you tell Heather I'm still waiting for her? <laughs> I think we're going to be late, ma'am. <laughs> Wait, tell him to pick up that damn phone. And then uh, Heather gets back home to Dylan having a weird episode. There's episodes that kids have, which can be unusual, abnormal, And sometimes eccentric. funny to watch. What Dylan is doing, he's quoting Freddy in the Freddy voice. Never sleep again. Yeah. <laughs> and then he he like, sounded like a fucking troll from Troll 2. I, you know, it's... Who wore anything that this kid did? So Heather calls Chase, tells him, hey, you need to come home. Our, our son's worrying me. Has there been another phone call? Yes. yes. I'm on my way. And Freddy Glove is gone. Damn it, Freddy Glove. Chuck and Terry, those are the two other guys that died. Just when you think it's safe to go back into the tech world, the damn Freddy Glove is missing. So now we get fairy tale time, and why does this kid need his mom to read the story when he knows the entire thing by heart? Well... Why is this mom also giving him the wrong ending? Because this is just a fairy tale ending. The real ending, which... I can kind of see somewhat how this plays in the actual. Oh, yeah. This is, this is smart writing because this is actually what they're doing is they're foreshadowing what's actually going to happen in the movie. Right, so. but have you ever heard of the original ending for Hansel and Gretel? It's much darker, I know. It is much darker. Yes, they still get away from the witch. Come to find out the parents. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I know. They get back to town and Hansel finds out that Gretel is being 
um, imprisoned by the government for tax evasion. No. That's the version I heard, so I'm just saying. No, what happened was... Tax evasion. It was a tax evasion. The parents could not afford both them or the kids, so the father takes the kids out to try to get rid of them. The breadcrumb trail never actually happened, and when the kids eventually got away from the witch, they could not find their parents. You know, we got these fairy tales very different in Pakistan. Tax evasion, that's what I was thinking. All right, but anyways, okay, yeah. But look, yeah, you can't tell little Dylan that, and he's already freaking out going, Never sleep again! Yeah, and then we get this weird whole monologue of the ending to Hansel and Gretel that he does. I'm sitting there like, kid, just stop talking. The kid lied, he made it up. Kid, just stop talking. Yeah. I cannot take this kid seriously, because then he gives us these, the weirdest faces in this whole damn movie, too. Yeah, but do we blame him? Do we blame the acting coach? Do we blame his parents? Who do we blame? I blame everything. I mean, listen, it's just, I, it's hard for me. I always, in this case, I always want to blame the director or the, the, something else other than the actual kid because they put him in this position to do what he's doing. And if it's not right, they could have told him, hey, let's do that, let's do that one more time without the weird facial expression. Fair. But another thing is, Heather, when Dylan tells him, yeah, Rex is down there to protect me from the bad man. And she goes, Dylan, there's nothing down there. But uh, she, I know this is meta and all, and th- this is classified as real life, but uh, you're starting to have these dreams too. Yeah, but she's still, the movie does a good job with her. Uh, you can see her slow development from I'm not believing this to I'm sort of believing this to I'm all in. It's a gradual thing. At this point in the movie, to be fair to her, she's still kind of like, I mean, yeah, I'm having weird dreams, but... Maybe what happens to her husband is going to be the first real sign of mm, some real shit's happening there. So speaking of her husband, he falls asleep at the wheel. Now, did you think of Dan's death from Part 5 here? Because I thought this was a kind of a callback a little bit. It was a callback to Dan's death in Part 5. The only difference is this one was dark instead of funny. Yeah, we didn't get him turning into Ghost Rider. No. What we I would have loved it, though. What happened was <laughs> Freddy literally just shot out of the seat and ripped his ass open. Yeah, it's funny this Freddy, so in part five with Dan, he's messing with him, but really Dan wakes up and gets hit by a truck pretty much. Yes. And this one, the claw actually rips him open, which is what kills him. And then, of course, the truck crashes, even though he has no injuries from the actual crash, just the claw marks. So my theory is that... Freddy protected his body except for the claw marks to scare him, to scare Heather into believing him. Yeah, he he knew Freddy. She, he knew Nance. He knew Heather was gonna look at the body. So just like the earthquake claw, he wanted her to see a claw imprint to again be like, "I'm coming for you." But I thought this. But I, I read something online that initially they were just gonna have Chase disappear from the movie. He's gonna go and be working on the set or like that. But then maybe comes back at the end. But it wasn't actually a death scene. But it was something where, I guess after they did it, I don't know if it was a reshoot, but they actually felt like they needed more actual death scenes in the movie. They felt the movie was too scar- too scarce on actual death scenes. Mm. So that's why they killed them. But I think initially Is it was like... Is that why they also just added that whole thing about Chuck and Terry being found dead? Yeah, initially, because you know, a, a lot of people in the movie actually disappear. Yeah. They don't get killed off. They just They just disappear. I think he was even one of those, like, just, well, he went off somewhere, but maybe at the end he comes back. But thinking about it, it's pretty harsh that her, her husband dies and his, his father dies. I mean, that's pretty, now, pretty brutal. So, so the police come and ask her, you know, to give her the bad news. She says, ma'am, it's about your husband. Is he hurt? Well, it's worse than that. What happened? It's like, uh, lady, what can be, what, what's worse than death? Or what is worse than being hurt? I'm pretty sure that's death. This is kind of an awkward scene. I gotta admit, this is this was not. Uh, like, I don't think this is not Heather Langham's strongest moment because you're right. The, the the dialogue of, it's worse than that, and her taking five minutes to be like, oh, worse than that. Is he dead? It's like, um, if I'm the cop, I'm like, why are you making this so hard for us to tell you? <laughs> can you can you put two and two together and make our life a little bit easier? You want us to spell it out for you? He got clawed in the damn chest, all right? Right. So. So do you want to talk about the morgue scene or just shoot for the funeral scene? Well, the, the purpose of the morgue scene was exactly what I said. Freddie's just sending her messages through whatever means he can. Mm-hmm. And this was, again, to put in her brain again that my husband was not killed in a car accident. Something clawed him. 
Right. Now, the funeral scene, what's interesting is, did you notice all the cameos in that? Oh, yeah. You got uh, Rod from part one, obviously John Saxon, but he's not really a cameo. He's a prominent role in this movie, sort of. Uh, Tuesday night was there. Yep. I saw Tuesday night. Uh, I think the actress, uh, uh, Lisa Wilcox, I think she was there, too. I can't, re- I can't remember exactly the cast. So one actress who said no at the last second was the character of – who play, the. The girl who played Amanda in the first one, his first, his first victim. Okay. She actually originally was meant to have a little bit of a bigger role in this movie, and she turned it down. But they had some plan to make her a little more prominent, since she is one of the main actors. She was one of the main actresses from R one. Mm. And interesting casting note: a year or two later, I guess Wes Craven had seen Johnny Depp somewhere and talked to him, and he had asked Johnny Depp, like, you know, he was like, you know, I didn't think you would be in this, but, like, if I asked you, what do you have done? And Johnny Depp was like, yeah, you should ask me. <laughs> yeah. So we could have got some kind of role of, for Johnny Depp here also, which would have been very interesting mm-hmm. just to have Freddy kill off real-life Johnny Depp or him Or the have Johnny Depp fight Freddy for real with a baseball bat. And, and <laughs> to support what Johnny's saying, there's evidence because he actually made a cameo on Freddy's dead. Mm-hmm. So that was two years earlier. So obviously he wasn't like just shitting on the series. He was just in Freddy's Dead. Well, so why wouldn't he? Johnny, be in that from what I understand, Johnny Depp loves the series. He loves. it. I think just like he had so much success outside of it, like nobody really asked him about it. It wasn't like a thing. If his career hadn't turned out wherever, I'm sure he'd be like doing the horror conventions and all that. Mm-hmm. But nobody asked him about it because he has so much other stuff. Like you're interviewing Johnny Depp, and you'd be like Pirates of the Caribbean. Also, I think the actress who played Taryn was there even also. Probably. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm saw it in the background. I'm thinking the idea would have been mostly people from part one and three. Mm-hmm. Although, the, so the inclusion of Tuesday night's a little bit off. <laughs> but, like, why would Tuesday night be close with Heather Langham? Right. But I, I guess we'll assume they go to horror conventions together. Um, oh, uh, the, the coffin, there's an earthquake at the funeral. Yep, and Heather falls and hits her head. And this is where we get the first reveal of what Freddy looks like in this movie. A lot of people think the first reveal actually was the bedroom scene later, like 30 minutes down the line. Yeah. No, it's actually this scene. Yeah, you do get... um. Freddy's I mean, he face. doesn't talk. He doesn't talk at all. He laughs. But you can see this ain't motherfucking Freddy's dead, Jason. No. Or Freddy's well, dead, Freddy. Yeah. He, not, only not, not only does he look bigger, more intimidating, he looks a little bit more evil. Yeah, I'm just going to say right now, Freddy has the best makeup in this movie of the whole series. Genu- I would say genu- since part three. Genuinely scary. You know, this playground scene. Makes no damn sense to me. I'm going to just go ahead and say it right now. Instead of waiting for the categories, this is the worst scene in the movie. Uh, fair. Because, re- first, mean, of all, first of all, on, on one positive side, we get John Saxon, who's always good. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to know that him and Helen Camp are that close that they're having a, a real heart to heart talk. Right, but the real question I got, so I can understand why Heather didn't see it right away because she's kind of enthralled in talking to John Saxon, but how come nobody, none of the other parents, none of the kids said, oh my God, who's that kid? Yeah. That would have shocked Heather into looking up and be like, oh no. Even one of the other kids would have been at least aware enough to be like, hey, don't go up there. Right. Or the parents. I'm not going to say poor Dylan because he's consciously doing it. Dylan over here uh, climbing to the top of the sky. Because he wants to reach God. I, I know they were trying to do something deep here, but I don't... It didn't, it, no, it did not work at all. It, it looked like the kid trying to be suicidal, and that didn't work for me. But you know what? Especially egregious to me. Not egregious, but I'm going to give you a real missed opportunity in this scene, though, right? You're at the playground, right? At the very end, as you cut away in the background, have the little three girls on the jump rope. Oh, that would have been so perfect just to see that in the background and be like, oh, shit, that, those, are the, those are three girls in the jump rope. It would have been such a nice callback and to show you that, again, Freddy's coming into this world. Right. No, but they didn't do it. They're at the, the playground. Why? No, but... Um, anyway. So now this is the first time we hear about the letters. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes... How come we didn't hear about this when they first talked about the stalker? I don't know, and the letters are getting weird. Now they're saying, I know what you did last summer, and I just think that's a weird thing to send to have a so. So she talks to Robert England actually about Freddy being eviler, darker, and Robert England apparently has been having nightmares himself. Yeah. And, and he disappears. And he's painting his ass off, too. Apparently, Robert England's an artist. Well, since we're talking about that, let's, let's dive into this because this is a very interesting thing to me. So, yes, she's going to visit Robert, but Robert leaves town, basically. 
You could take this a couple different ways. Like, did he actually leave town, or... Did he try to confront this new Freddy? I thought it... I thought it was something like, basically, like, they can't exist in the same world, so Freddy had to make him disappear for him... For Freddy to come in the physical form, mm. he had to just take over or replace the human Robert England. Because you Ooh. notice, he doesn't really make his appearance into this world, basically, until he makes Robert England disappear. Fair. But, uh, uh, it was it was a little bit unexplored, but instead of that, she goes to see Wes Craven. Yep, and Wes Craven tells her, explains pretty much the whole plot. Yeah, and uh, my which question, again, do we really need a plot summary of what this, we just watched? For this movie, I think so. This is the most complex plot of any Nightmare movie, so I think Wes spelling it out for the audience actually. Some people watch the movie even with this plot summary and still don't know what's going on because it's that complex. You would not get. Take out the West scene, you would not get the whole the demon concept of like an ancient demon. All that's only in this scene. That would not be apparent to you from watching the rest of the movie. You would just think Freddy's coming. At the end, it would have been. No, still not. Because he turns into a demon right before he explodes. Yeah, but not the actual backstory of the villain. It's not even Freddy. It's a demon. First of all, the first question about this scene: Does Wes Craven have the biggest damn swimming pool in the history of the world? Yes. Did you see a swimming pool? Yes. You could have the damn summer. I want it. The damn summer Olympics in his pool. I want it. Um. So anyways, this. Now, this is the critical scene in the movie. And by the way, Wes Craven's a damn good actor. It's like, isn't the, the way he talks is like riveting. Like, I, I would listen to Wes Craven really um, because, tell me stories. So. Because originally this movie, from what I heard of rumors, originally Wes Craven was supposed to be the main actor, and then he was like, no. I, I, they filmed a few scenes, and then he was like, nope, let's get real actors for this. I like him as an actor. I think he delivers his lines in a certain way, like an authentic way. But you get the key backstory, which, like I said, a this de- you, you need to spell out, basically. The idea that a demon, ancient demon, um, can sometimes get trapped in the story. And I'm going to try to sum this up, and it's not even that easy to sum up. But basically, if you... It's like a genie in a bottle. If you stop telling the story, or if the story gets watered down, using Wes's words, then the demon can escape into our world. Yep, and that's... But he still has to... Defeat the first person that humiliated this character that the demon is using. Yes. Hence, Heather Langenkamp. Yep. And, and, and actually, going by the series, we can say both they stopped making movies because Freddy's Dead was the last one, and Watered Down because Freddy's Dead was extremely watered down Freddy. That is fair. And, okay, so now we get your phone scene, which is a callback to the very first movie. Yep. De- so... First, Dylan attacks Heather, and she wakes up because it was a dream. Heather, you tell me you can't fight off your own kid. Yeah, you know I'm not I'm not for child abuse, but if your kid's kicking your ass, you got to get him off you. Exactly. Uh, and then she goes downstairs. She's hearing Dylan pretty much sing the nursery rhyme. And while well, walking around the well, letters, is this, is this where we see actually Dylan watching the movies? No. Okay, now yeah. Okay. No, the movies was the very first scene with Dylan. He was uh, at the TV, look at, watching the TV as Heather comes out after getting right. dressed. Okay. But um, so he's circling the letters that says "Answer the phone." So he answers the phone, and then blah, 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 he tries to French kiss her. <laughs> you know, this is Freddy. This ain't this ain't no demon. That's fucking Freddy. <laughs> I'm convinced that. Wes thought he knew he was talking about here, but that's actually Freddy, maybe. And the he kid, has Freddy's sense of humor. And the kid, I guess, has rabies. Yep. That would explain a lot about this kid. Well, she's got to take him to the hospital and get a shot then, so. Yep, where Lynn Shay as a nurse. She's played everything else. She might as well be a nurse, too. Right, and I don't even know the actress's name that plays the, do- the actual doctor in this movie. I can see they're flirting with the idea that she's, like, the human villain, but everything she's saying is perfectly rational. She's questioning Heather as a mother and questioning, like, what's wrong with your kid and are you seeing things? Like, everything she does is pretty rational, but they kind of have to paint her as, like, a... Kind in, of a, the incom- antagonist. Incompetent antagonist. But I was cool with her. I didn't have a problem with her. It was like kind of like uh, Dr. Sims, where it's like, well, she's kind of just doing her job. So. Well, now we get uh, the part where Chuck and Terry's deaths are now confirmed. Their bodies have been found completely mutilated. They've been dead for at least a week. Yep. Uh, earthquake happens. Power goes out. And this is where Freddy... I, I now pronounce you Chuck and dead. So. Yep. Yeah. And now Freddy jumps in. With a pretty decent jump scare. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
to say pretty decent is even underselling it. This is an amazing scene. This is going to be my favorite scene in the movie because the buildup, you have the, the earthquake where the lights go out because of the earthquake. Oh, and also Nancy actually hides herself under a doorway. Yeah, well, now, Oh, my gosh. So you didn't know that. So you just want your kid to die. Now without a child, she's actually being safe and following proper protocol. <laughs> um, okay, so the lights go out. And usually the lights going out in horror movies don't scare me, but knowing she's alone in the house, in a big house, and the lights being out, there's something creepy about this whole scene. When Freddy pops up... And says the most famous line in all of Freddy. Miss me. Yeah. <laughs> If, it, if it's your first time seeing the movie, that's a really good jump scare. And the whole scene afterwards, it feels like they're fighting again like part one. But, man. And you get to actually see now, really, you get to really see Demon Freddy. Oh, yeah. You get to really see Demon Freddy. And, and now then, Nancy knows this shit's real, too. Yep. So she goes back to the hospital to try and get Dylan because now she finally realizes Dylan is not insane. He's just being possessed by Freddy. Yeah, and... And the doctor asks her how she gets the mark on her arm, and she says the earthquake from 20 minutes ago. And the doctor says, there was no earthquake. What earthquake? Well, first she says, well, we must have lucked out over here. Very sarcastically. But I will also say this. The dream sequence Nancy has about the doctor become, pretty much becoming Freddy. Awesome. The way the doctor is saying, I'm going to cut this evil out of him, is actually pretty nice. That was a good line. At least with the, at the accent of the character. Yeah, that that I'm, if it was actual Freddy saying it, it probably wouldn't have been as great. The, that was a cool, good scene for the actress because, like, that was so out of character, it's out of nowhere. Oh Crazy. yeah. Even though, again, the claw, the makeshift claws for the characters, again, still makes no sense. You'd think it would have just been a Freddy, the Freddy claw. But so, what about the death of Julie? The death of Julie is exact, is almost exactly the same as the death of Tina in the first movie. You know, one too many times, she said, what are you waiting for? And Freddie said, oh, okay, well, listen, Ben Willis may not get you, but I'm going to get you. <laughs> yeah, Again, a it, darker, was a, it was a callback to uh, part one. But yeah. it's still a darker Freddy because, and also this Freddy is able to hurt you when you're not the one dreaming. Because Julie wasn't dreaming, it was Dylan. Dylan got Freddy there. I think, I think Wes felt like once we let Freddy cross over in this world as he's getting more power that there are no dream rules or anything. Because you're right, there's no reason for Julie to be in danger here. Mm. Uh, Dylan's dreaming and seeing Freddy behind her, but she's wide awake and protecting him. And, and um, then she and she protects him pretty much the entire time until right before she knows she's dead. She's just likable enough to where this death is like, oh, damn. Oh, yeah. Because during the whole death scene, she keeps telling Dylan, run, get out of here. And then finally at the end, she realizes what's going on. She goes, help me. I was like, and this Freddy breaks necks. You know, I, I hate to bring it up again. But I just, I just really hope she was well paid. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she got to enjoy the last months of her life with a, a well-paying babysitter job. Because if she was underpaid and she got killed like that, you know, I just can't handle that. So, so again, it kind of shows that this Freddy isn't really playing playing around. He's actually he still got his one-liners though. You ever play skin the cat? I mean, it, it, it's like he's he's Freddy, but he's definitely more. Sinister version, right? Because, because, uh, yes, it was a call back to Tina, and Tina's death wasn't exactly meant to be played for laughs either. But this one, Tina's he, death was the bloodiest shit I've ever seen in my life. This one, he drags her up the ceiling and then snaps her neck. He did not play with this character at all. <laughs> nope. And I don't I know mean, what's scarier when Freddy plays with his characters or when he just straight out mutilates them. I don't know, but this was pretty. This is pretty rough for a little kid to see. Oh, yeah. So he's, this kid. He's calling for his damn little babe, uh, dinosaur Rex, doll. And then runs out. And, okay. Um, quick question. Sure. High security hospital, right? Yep. Guards everywhere. Absolutely. Doctors everywhere. Yep. How the fuck can a little kid get out of this hospital without being fucking seen? He's in pajamas. In pajamas. <laughs> Without being seen. Oh, oh, man. He didn't even... Heather's like, he sleepwalks. He can clearly get out of here. He's like, how? He, I don't, he doesn't even look strong enough to open the damn doors at this hospital. You or know, tall enough to even reach the damn door. You know, as smart as this movie is, this movie is really intelligent. It that, has its dumb moments. That was hard to believe, especially 
since uh yeah one of the one of the doctors is just like oh yeah i just saw dylan uh whatever and she's like he sleepwalks it's like um anybody any adult who sees a little kid walking pajamas like that is probably going to at least like check on what's going on there right and to be honest with you is this kid really sleepwalking i mean yes no. well i don't know because clearly he's seeing freddie all over the place but that might just be his real thing but i I'm going to say, special, special effects-wise, him looking back and seeing all the Freddies coming up, amazing. Love now, that. here's the real question I got. So, in this highway scene, as amazing as this scene actually is with the intensity, the score of it. How the Lancaster should be dead. That. And um, now, this kid obviously knows his own mortality at this point. This kid yep. knows he's not safe. He's in risk of being killed. And yet, he still decides to walk across... A highway. Look, <clears throat> let me break it down for you kid math, all right? So little Dylan on the other side of the highway, he's thinking about it like this. He's, he's thinking, he's seeing all these cars coming, right? Eight miles per hour, right? Most likely one of them's going to run him over, right? He's weighing that, right? So the kid math is, okay, I have that. I'm most likely going to die. But then he's thinking about his dinosaur Rex. He's like, yeah, but if I get past the cars, my, my protection, my dinosaur Rex is on the other side. is going to protect me, right? So he's doing the math in his head, in his head and he says, all right, I figured out. I know what I do. I put, I put it together. I'm going to cross the road and get to Rex. And, and that's kid math. So. You do know if Freddy wasn't there to actually pick the kid up, he would have died. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> dead, dead kid walking right there. Oh, yeah. But, but my question is. How is Heather still alive? Because she gets hit by a full-blown speeding car in the middle of the highway. Full-blown on kid with a car. Oh, yeah. Now, I know, I know when they say when your kid's in trouble, apparently there's a thing like a, a mother's adrenaline, a mother's strength, basically, or adrenaline. If your kid's in trouble, uh, they say a mom could pick up a car if you need to be to save your kid. But a damn car ran her over, right? Well, I'm going to say, Heather Langenkamp is almost immortal in this last couple of minutes of this movie. And I'm going to explain why. But first, let's get to the fact that John Saxon, is, he's either influenced by Freddy or because of where he thinks Heather's delusions are so bad that he has to play the father character one more time for Heather. So this is brilliant. I like this a lot because you remember in the scene with Wes, Wes was like, you know, when the time comes, you're going to have to ask yourself, are you willing to play Nancy one last time? So he's already hinting at the idea of something like that's coming, basically. John Saxon, when he's at the house, at first he is John Saxon. But right when the scene starts... He says Nancy. And then he's still, though, John Saxon. But then within a couple lines of dialogue, he changes to uh, Lieutenant, whatever his character's name was. Right. And then he's walking out the house and he keeps saying Nancy. And it's not so obvious. It's like really smart how they do it because she starts to pick on Like, finally, she's like, why do you keep calling me Nancy? Well, why do you keep calling me John? And then all of a sudden he gets in his cop car now. He didn't come in that damn cop car. Mm -hmm. He drives away. When she turns around, it's the nightmare house, and the damn nightmare music plays. Oh my god! If you're a fan, if you've been watching the series, like that's like you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. Oh yeah, it's amazing. It, can, woo, it just makes me wonder. Brilliant. Was it John Sachs, the influence of Freddy, or was it something else? And also, Freddy just coming out of the bed slowly as the scene progresses, and then finally, when John Saxon leaves, Freddy then feels like it's safe to come out. Well, the one, the one thing with John Saxon turning back into the cop, okay, let's say this is uh, Wes's script that he's writing, right? And so the movie world is becoming the real world. Shouldn't Wes know that that character died in part three? <laughs> <laughs> John Saxon should just disappear as the movie world becomes the real world. He should just disappear like Robert England disappears, I think, because he's actually playing Freddy. Like, Fred, the demon Freddy has taken over Robert England's human body, and has, that's, that's the reason why he's just disappeared. John Saxon, this character should be dead, so he shouldn't even be in the movie. And also notice how Freddy now has a trench coat, which is a callback to Wes's uh, actual childhood trauma of a, what, some guy he saw in the middle yep. of the street that actually scared the hell out of him. Looked him, looked right up into his apartment, stared him in the eyes, and scared the shit out of him. Yeah, and the guy even had a trench coat, was wearing a trench coat, and I think he said a fedora as well. Yeah. And which, also, is where the actual, which is where the uh, outfit for Freddy came from. And notice also the um, the Nosferatu uh, Dracula reference where comes out the sheet mm -hmm. and then you got the shadow on the wall. That's clearly a homage to everything. So. Oh, yeah. So now this is where I pretty much say Heather has to be immortal. 
She takes, what, five sleeping pills? Yep. You do know taking that much, she should have overdosed. Here's my theory. We didn't see it, but she was already a raging drug addict. So for her, she had a super high tolerance. Normally, she takes 10 pills a night, so this five pills is just, hey, this is, hey, she takes 10 pills to sleep at the night. These five pills are just for a little nap, a little nappy nap. So then she's in hell, actually, because she's already dead. If your theory is correct, she's dead. I'm going to say, as much as I like this movie. How ha- does she be dead? <laughs> well, not that. I'll say, okay, when she starts to follow the breadcrumbs under the sheet, going into whatever demon world she's going to. Which I don't necessarily love this ending where it goes from here. It's kind of weird. And well, they, what, is, what is this world she goes to? Yeah, it literally looks like Rome. Like, is this demon old enough to remember Rome? It looked, I mean, like, it looked like I would think that's where, like, if Freddy's in hell, I would think that that's, like, the hell Freddy's in. But, Rome. No, well, yeah, I guess Rome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but, yeah, I, there wasn't enough explanation of what this place is. Is that demon Freddy's lair? Like, um, well, I, I would have liked her to have gone down, and then she pops up into the, the boiler room basement that we know and love. Right. Just to call back to that classic back in the scene. He took her to uh, Rome to uh, Pan's Labyrinth or some shit. So what happens is then Freddy, Freddy and Nancy fight a little bit with Freddy kicking her ass. Of course. This is definitely not Freddy from Freddy's Dead. But it is the Freddy from Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah. Because that man can kick some ass. Oh, yeah. And, the, and again, should have died had he not decided I'm going to prolong me bringing my claws in the air so the little Dylan can stab me in the lake. Let's talk about how long Freddy's tongue is, because that's a very vers- <laughs> it's a versatile, stretchable tongue. Well, this mofo's tongue stretches around the whole damn room. So I gotta notice they pretty much make Freddy for the most part in this scene a snake person. Yeah, because even when he throws her into a cauldron, a bunch of snakes pop out. That's why it seemed like hell to me, because it was kind of like you have the snakes and all this imagery that people would think of as like as hell. hell. Yeah, and then especially the the fire element too. Right. Now, now, I guess the irony is that, I guess from the writing standpoint, it's like, what other way can we kill this person other than fire? Is, that's like the Freddy thing, right? It's fire, I guess. Well, so, somewhere, Lori was writing the script and was like, Jason's scared of water, Freddy's... <laughs> how, can we use, how can we use that? And Wes was like, this is how you use it. All right? Yeah, but even so, like I said, this movie, th- this ending, Freddy might as well be a snake because, think about it, at the end... He unhinges his jaw. Yep. His tongue literally wraps around Heather and then becomes pronged even because Dylan his, stabs it. His tongue becomes a damn anaconda snake. So. Yeah. And then, you know, they throw him in the boiler as it, or the oven. So this is a callback now also to Hansel and Gretel. Yep. Where so he, that's where the foreshadowing was. Yep. And he turns into a legitimate demon and explodes. Kaboom. Yes. Dead Freddy now. And so, so we end the movie with Heather reading exactly what we just watched. Do you really want this kid to have nightmares? Yeah, I thought you didn't let your kid watch your movies. Yeah, if right. you don't let him watch your movies, why would you read the script to that movie? You know, especially one that that kid just lived through. The problem with the ending is that it's almost like there's no satisfying way to kill Freddy at the end because. He's been built up as this actual dream entity who's been here forever. So the idea that Heather Langkamp actually defeated him, this is not incompetent Freddy from the Freddy ser- from Nightmare on Elm series who every teenage group he comes upon has somebody who defeats him. This is like an ancient dream demon, uh, dream demon something, demon something. I, he kind of got killed pretty easily. Yeah? It wasn't that extravagant of an ending for Mr. Old Demon there. Yeah? Canon-wise... This is the end of Freddy, canon-wise, because, I mean... He ends up, he's in hell in the next movie. Yeah, I'm... Or I'm, purgatory. I'm projecting that in this universe of New Nightmare, that Freddy vs. Jason also is just a movie, so... So this is the end of Demon Freddy. It makes sense to me, of course, that, that Heather Langham would defeat him. I was a little bit underwhelmed by the ending, I gotta be honest. I, but there was no... You wrote it in such a way that's like, how do you kill him? I mean... It's almost like how, like Return of the Living Dead. How in the world can you kill something that you pretty much just made immortal? So it was a little bit underwhelming, but I got a question, though. So uh, apparently this is all a script that Wes wrote. Because they showed when they had the scene with Wes where 
He's like, he's saying, I'm writing the script, basically. And you could see on the pages that the dialogue is what he was saying. Mm -hmm. So he's writing the script. Was he writing those death scenes in there? Was he at a point like, and now Julie dies. <laughs> uh, Wes, did you write that death scene for that poor babysitter? Did yes. You, did you write the death of Heather Lancap's husband? Yes. Because that would have been in the script. Yes. Because I'm on board with him. So, right? I'm on board with him writing the script. But you killed her husband by putting that in the script? Good job, Wes. Or did Good he, job. Or the real question is, did he write that part? After the death. So you think the next day Heather got a call from Robert England just being like, yeah, like, I don't know what I, where I've been the last couple of days, but I just woke up this morning back in my house. And because you have to assume everything kind of returned back to normal the next day. And the human Robert England is allowed back in the world. So, But not her husband. Her husband's still dead. The twist ending should have been that as she's reading the script, though, there's a knock on the door. She opens it. There's Chase. No, it's John Saxon. He's oh. like, it's like, Nancy, what are you doing? He's like, no! He's like, you should be John Saxon. You're still my dad. Yep. He's like, Nancy, I left my badge here. He's like, oh, shit. He's out there solving crimes. All right. So now on to the categories. Best performance for me is Robert England. I know we said yeah, we well, would not use Robert England for this series, but in this one, I think is allowed because, to be fair, he has to play a completely different Freddy. He had a Freddy that is not throughout the entire series. He has to play himself as well. I want which to. Which probably was very easy for him. I, I, I think he had a hell of a performance. Oh, yeah. But I want to give a shout out to Heather Lingkamp because I think of the movies she's in, I think this is her best performance. She's a way better actress there than part one or part three. And she's in almost every scene. I got to say that she basically carries the movie. As good as Freddy is, he's just in the first half. He's just not in it enough for me to. Okay. Him, so. Worst character, Dylan. Man, Dylan. You know, Dylan and Chase combined for me. As I think back, did you actually need Chase in the movie? Not yes. really. You no, gotta no, kill him. No, I, I mean, just have her, have her be a single mother because I don't know. But she's not a single mother in real life. They were supposed to go, they were going meta with it. Well, I guess that's true. Okay, so let's go to Dylan, man. <laughs> I like, Dylan, I mean, look, I mean, you can't... The kid annoyed me in every damn scene he was in. You can't get around the fact that he's a kid actor doing Freddy voice. and No. He did a worse Freddy voice than Jacob in Part 5 when he was like, Come on, Freddy, let's hang out together. So, well, I don't know why my kid voice sounds British, but listen to it. So him. the best scene, in my opinion, is Julie's death scene. Oh, good one. I, I love it just because it definitely shows Freddy's not playing no more. He really wants to get the hell out, and he wants to get to killing people. And the just the amount of evil you need for someone who's completely defenseless against you definitely shows how, really, as you brought up, this Freddy should not have been killed. If he's able to kill people when they're not even dreaming. Yeah, I think it shows, too. It shows that the body count's not as important as just that the death scenes you do have are memorable. Mm-hmm. There's only a few deaths in this movie, but the deaths are all pretty memorable. Um, I'm going to go with what I was just talking about as far as, like, when the real world turns into the movie, basically, with John Saxon. Because just like I said, you've been watching all the movies, like, when that Nightmare music hits, you feel like you're rewarded for being a fan. You're like, ooh, this is, like, a good callback. So I got to go with that. And, yeah. and, and I already gave my worst scene, which is the motherfucking playground. So. Yep. Uh, same here. Explored more. Uh, demon, the demon layer, really. The demon itself. The demon, the demon lair. Yeah. Pretty much everything about this demon. The, 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 the story is so interesting, right? Because what they could have done is done the whole ending, but in order to beat this Freddy, they should have had an exorcism at the end to, to get the evil out of him. Yeah. Um, Literally. Yeah. Everything Probably with the, not, but still. Everything with the actual story of the movie... Like I said, that's why I love that scene with Wes Craven because he's actually given the plot. But this is one movie where you're actually like, hmm, tell me more. You're like, this is interesting as shit. Tell me more. <laughs> um, in fact, the most interesting things in the movie about that I would like to see more was Wes Craven and human Robert England. <clears throat> Just their reactions and what they were going through during all this, more scenes with them would have been welcome like crazy. So, What would you eliminate? I, uh, no, wait, wait, wait. I can make it difficult for us by just saying if we – Put Dylan to the side because that's too. It's almost like so obvious. It's like, is there something else? I was about to say, just like Freddy versus Jason. Do I really need to answer this question? Yeah, but it's so obvious. It's almost fun to think there's something else you would do outside of that. All right, Chuck and Terry. 
Yeah. Chucky. I mean, yeah, they. I mean, what was really the point of killing those two characters off? There wasn't one. Yeah. There's no point in even mentioning them except for these two didn't come in to work today. True. Leave it at that. I, I'm going to say everything with Chase. <laughs> Uh, Chase's scenes that he's that he's in, and even his death seemed to me that it was all kind of just him dying didn't seem to leave any lasting impact on Heather or the kids. So hmm. I'm I'm cool with if uh, Chase. Well, he was eliminated from the movie. Yeah, but in the I, first thirty minutes. Yeah, I'm, I, he was pretty relevant. I, I could have done without him in the movie, though. Also, well, I guess my final thoughts is to be honest, I really wanted it wanted to give this a three point five like I did one and three, but that kid. That kid just kills it for me. I can't get over that kid. The, the kid is worth taking away half a star. I'm, I'm a, not I'm just. A, I'm aboard. Well, yeah, okay. Well, you, you're about to give it a one, aren't you? <laughs> He's like, that kid just cost this movie three and a half stars. <laughs> like, damn, yeah. but think about what you're doing. It man. did cost it three and a half stars, Let but me, instead. Appeal to, appeal to your better senses before you go too down on it because the but, kid. So. And to be honest, a few other. So the kid definitely takes it down half a star, but some of the glaring issues about this movie, mainly some things about the end, the fact that Heather really should be dead with some of the damage she takes in this movie. She might as well be Jason Voorhees again. So to be honest, the music was great. The acting for the most part was phenomenal. Maybe not phenomenal, but it was still pretty good. For the Nightmare series, phenomenal. Yeah. And all the different callbacks was just amazing. So I'm going to give this a two and a half. Ooh. That still seems harsh. Um, I'm a harsh person. Yeah, you are. Jesus. Um, I'm going to give it three stars. <clears throat> Realistic for me, the kid's only negative. Everything else is all positive. I cannot downgrade the movie for just one kid who has, granted, a lot of screen time, a lot of lines, and a lot of central part of the story. He's literally half the movie. But I don't have a problem with his character so much as just the the acting is kind of weird. But I can see where his character is important in the movie. Um, you can't get rid of him. You need him in the center of the plot. But the whole idea of the movie is just, it gets three stars just on the idea of following the actors. It's just so meta for 1994. It's an amazing story. If they, I feel like the new screen movie, they should do that. They should just follow the actors and have someone stalk in them. It's just a cool idea. And then all the callbacks. Like I said, I think that a top tier so far is part one, part three, and this. And it's like, as a trilogy, it's probably one of the best. If you look at it like that way, it's probably one of the best horror trilogies you could possibly do. So I'm going to go with three stars. Any other thoughts, Nick, before we uh, close up shop for this week? Yeah. If you hear somebody say, miss me in your closet, don't go to your closet. Go outside. Go to your neighbor's. Call the cops. This is probably something you don't want to be coming face to face with. And also, follow proper protocol when there's an earthquake. There's a procedure you should follow. And just running over to your kid and jumping on his bed and saying, Ah, earthquake! It's probably not the right way to go. Yeah, because you, your husband, and your kid are all going to die if that house falls on you. Have a good night. <laughs>